Hi, everyone. Uh, I would just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're collectively meeting today and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, thank you for coming along to this. I will start by saying uh, I think this kind of captures partly the moment that we're currently in. Uh, and it's kind of risky to be talking about generative AI at the moment um, without kind of coming across as somebody who's been a bit of an opportunist. In my defence, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, a technical person. Uh, we have great technical people around the university in this space, particularly Anisha and Hassan and Shazia. Um, I think they do a wonderful job. I, I don't come at this from a technical perspective, but what I have been doing is we've been playing around with various different types of chatbots um, since the late 90s, I realised a few weeks back. Um, we were using this, Eliza, which has been around since the 60s. And the point of doing this, so um, as Dom said, I, I work primarily in educational psychology, was to think about what it meant for human intelligence and how we could make sense of human intelligence by comparing with machines. So. I've more been in that human computer interaction space rather than in the kind of technical side of AI. So if anybody's got any questions about that sort of thing, I'm not gonna be much help, but the interface between the two is the space that I've, I've kind of been working in. And you'll see that that kind of flavors the way that uh, I and the people that I've been working with are coming at the, the questions that are emerging from through generative AI and chat GPT. So let's just touch on this. I think there are a couple of things that I think probably many of you are on top of, but just so we're all kind of on the same page about what it is that we're really talking about here. Obviously, a lot of the discussion has emerged uh, because of the availability now of ChatGPT and then um, Bing and BARD and other tools that allow us to generate text in particular, but of course also images, um, audio and increasingly various different things, including now video and other kinds of multimedia. It's sort of been coming for a while, but I think many of us were probably taken a little bit by surprise. Oh, is that somebody's got all good? Um, so we've had to kind of adapt very rapidly. Again, I think probably many of you are aware of these sorts of things. Uh, with my limited technical understanding, I think largely what we're talking about here is deep learning and machine learning as opposed to this kind of general artificial intelligence. There is arguments out there about whether chat GPT and GPT-4 represent some sort of, you know, progress towards a general artificial intelligence that works across a whole number of different domains. I'm not entirely convinced by that, uh, but I think there are some implications of us kind of operating at that sort of level. Chat GPT and tools like it have been designed and developed with very specific purposes in mind. But they do have a narrow focus. So anytime we're thinking about what the implications are in an environment such as ours in education, the tools have not been designed with our use case specifically in mind. They do have a very narrow purpose. So I, I think it's always worth kind of keeping that in mind when we talk about some of the, the aspects of, of this. Here's our, our culprit. Um, chat GPT. I've got an example here where I've asked it to produce a lesson plan. It did a reasonable job with this. And this is something that I'm going to come back to because I think that there are some things that can be revealed by testing these environments. And I would certainly encourage any of you, if you haven't had a play around with uh, the freely available versions of Chat GPT or Bing, Bing is um, different, but uh, quite useful in other ways. Uh, I'd certainly encourage you to do do so. Um, these things are not going away. And I think that they do some pretty powerful things that are worth us getting our heads around, which should become obvious as we, as we work through this. It's not just these large language models of which GPT-4 is one example. There are also increasingly tools that are being built on top of these. Again, I don't know the technical details of that, but they allow us to take these basic kind of language models and do all sorts of amazing things with them. Um, the resolution is coming through a bit. Oh, that's weird. Sorry, Rowena. It might just be some of the images or as opposed to others, we'll see if we can get it to clear up. All right, so let's dig into what the problem with all of this is. Um, I think the initial response gave us some indication about the way that people were considering what it is that we're dealing with here. Queensland essentially banned the use of these tools in schools. Uh, and I think as far as I'm aware, that is still the case, officially banned, of course, within about five minutes 
uh, any of the tech savvy students <laughs> immediately found ways around this using VPNs and other um, ways of being able to access the technology. So a ban didn't really do the job. And there's sort of the other side of this equation where there has been a constant flow of uh, commentary out there saying, look, this is here now, this is a thing. And, you know, we've got to kind of adapt to this new environment that we find ourselves in. So let's talk a little bit about why it is that these bans are in place. I think as a precursor to starting to talk about what we can do uh, about this and what kinds of things that we need to consider with assessment, let's just dig into a little bit what we're really talking about here. So the main reason that I think the ban is in place, this again goes back to this argument, that we started off with is that there is concern about students using these technologies to cheat. Right, so that's that seems to be the primary goal, not really surprising. I'm sure that you all have got a sense of that as well. One of my favorite stories around this is the one where the student used it to cheat in an AI ethics class. So clearly that class didn't have the effect that it was designed to have. Um, so bottom line here, just again, so that we're all on the same page with all of this is that these tools essentially allow students to produce these plausible artifacts that they could submit for assessment tasks without doing any of the actual work. That was the major concern, I think, at the beginning. As we go through this, we'll say that that's become a lot more nuanced, that discussion, and I'll give you a sense of where that, that has kind of landed, where we are currently thinking about, um, you know, what it means to cheat and how we might break that apart. So let's talk about cheating and let's just unpack this for a second. I think. We know a lot about cutting corners, cheating, contract cheating, plagiarism. There's been an enormous amount of work done that I've, on this in our context in higher education over a number of years. I think both of these fairly recent books kind of captured where we have gone and where we are in terms of cheating in higher education pretty well. Um, so if you're working in this space, it's worth having a look at, at those for a view on you know, how we've developed our understanding. I think it's really important that we... Um, do kind of remind ourselves along the way here that many of our students don't want to cheat. That's not what they're aiming to do. Uh, and I think there's been some really good advice and some nicer data emerging about this, including this story in the conversation from this morning, which is that this is some data from the University of Sydney where the students are feeding back and saying, look, we want us to help you to understand how these things work. Don't just assume that we're going to be using these things to cheat all the time. And they've probably got a point. We're collecting data here and we're seeing a similar sort of theme uh, emerge in the, in the conversations that we're having with students. So I think it's always important to, to keep that in mind as a, as a starting point. However, we also know that um, from you know, many, many years of research, particularly in areas of forensic psychology, is that there are usually three components that need to be in place for, for anybody to be doing the wrong thing. They've got to have some sort of motive, uh, there's got to be the means to do it, and the opportunity needs to, to be there. The, the motive and the opportunity are always things that we've been grappling with. However, I think the means, the equation for the means to cheat has altered drastically. Obviously, the, the tools are now there, they're freely available. If I want to produce some sort of output, I can do that very quickly using these freely available tools. Contract cheating in the past, go to a website, make a payment, wait for them to come back to you. Right? There was The means were a little bit more difficult, even though that was obviously uh, far, far easier than it had been previously uh, before these websites became available. Now the means are you know, really accessible to students anytime, any place. So the equation has changed quite drastically. And I think it probably says to us that we need to be thinking more about what the motive is to be doing the wrong thing in the first place, to be cutting corners. And that might give us some clues about things that we might need to consider going forward. And I'll, I'll come back to that later on. The other component of all this, this was in December 2022. Uh, there isn't an updated version of this at the moment, but I think this is always a reminder to me that it's not just ChatGPT that has led to the availability of these tools. There are many, many of them out there, some of which are open and available, many of which, including some of the biggest ones, are not. So it's not just the tools that we're seeing emerge like GPT-3 and now GPT-4, 
there are many, many, many others out there. So the means to be able to use these large language models, interact with them, use them as a way to, to produce artifacts that might pass for assessment tasks, they're everywhere. But they're already everywhere and there are many, many more of these things uh, coming. The other thing I think that's important is that uh, this is already available for beta testers. So this is the Microsoft Copilot. And uh, bottom line with this one is that essentially these large language models are already being embedded in PowerPoint, in Word, in the basic applications that both we and our students are using on a day-to-day -day basis. So the point here is that the means to get a large language model or one of these tools to do the bulk of the work towards the production of an artifact that we might be assessing um, are not only easily available, they're in the tools and applications that our students are going to be using or are already using. So no getting away from that, I don't think. Um, so I think the bottom line here is that the means to cheat are essentially ubiquitous. There is another conversation happening at the moment uh, around the world about what these tools are actually being used for by students. Um, now this might be a little bit blurry as well. Um, I hope that some of these things are coming through and you can see them. The bottom line here or the take home out of this slide is that there is now a more nuanced conversation about what the tools are being used for and where the line is in terms of what is acceptable use and not acceptable use. So is it cheating if a student, for example, uses ChatGPT or another one of these generative AI tools to come up with ideas? If it's helping them to brainstorm ideas, but they write it up, is that cheating or not? If they write something and they get ChatGPT to edit it, is that cheating, right? There, are, there is a gray line here um, that is very difficult to pass at this stage. Where we've landed on this is to uh, try to categorize the different ways that we might look at what we might do, okay? So uh, we, we are working on these six categories. Ignore it, try to ban it, try to invigilate around it, embrace it, the, this new technology in some way, design around it, which I think the equation has changed quite dramatically in the last couple of months, or rethink what it is that we're doing. This is the way that we've worked through this. We've taken each of these six categories and we've tried to figure out what the short-term, medium-term and long-term viability of each of the, the approaches is. So I'm gonna work through each of them with you and give us a sense of, and give you a sense of where we think we are relative to each of the options. So let's start with kind of the more straightforward ones to begin with. So ignore this and hope it goes away. It is an option. <laughs> How viable it is, is a, a different story altogether. There are certainly a number of people out there who are continuing to make the argument that this is not really a thing, that we can probably say this is a, you know, a storm in a teacup and really we shouldn't be too concerned about it. This is a colleague of mine from the University of Sydney who, um, yeah, has decided he's not going to worry about it at all and just progress as per business as usual. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm convinced by that. Um, another colleague of mine who won't mind me, I won't name them, but uh, who won't mind me saying this is uh, he's very cynical about all of this and says, well, you know, a lot of what we do now is just that students come along, they pay their money and they get a degree. It's only if we really care about learning that this is a problem. <laughs> um, so there are certainly many people, some of whom I think have been in this space a long time and are very thoughtful in what they're doing, who still think that there is a case to be made that we're, um, you know, we've got nothing to worry about here. I'm not really convinced of that, but it's an argument. Part of the argument also comes from the idea that we've seen many of these types of things before. One of the classic examples, anybody who's been around for a while uh, is electronic whiteboards they were going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread they were going to change everything we did in classrooms and now you don't need to go very far around the university or if you go out into a school and there are many many of them sitting in corners collecting dust not being used and we know through the history of the emergence of educational technologies that there have been many that have been like this where uh yeah sorry i, I cut that I, I don't know if there's much more i can do to to make them any clearer. Most of the slides I've got are, um, are not image based, so hopefully they'll be okay. 
Uh, so there is an argument that we've seen many technologies emerge and they haven't really had the effect that was, you know, initially hyped around the technologies, including electronic whiteboards, tablets, MOOCs, the list goes on and on and on. Here's where we kind of land on this. So I think at the moment, basically, I think you might be able to get away with saying this is not really going to be a thing, but I think it's a risky proposition. I think, you know, there are a lot of people who have been in this space a very long time. I'm thinking like people like George Siemens, um, Tony Bates in Canada, who have been doing this a lot longer than I have, who are saying this is fundamentally different, the technology that we're dealing with here. So it's possible that we might get away with ignoring it in the, the short term, but I think in the medium and long term, it's unlikely that um, that's going to be a viable way to, to approach this. Option number two, we can start to think about banning it. So this is our classic that we started off with. As I said before, I think we probably can take our lead from the fact that this is going to be embedded into all of the applications that we're using. It's unlikely that that's going to be a viable long-term approach. Part of the equation here, of course, is that there is an element of this that if you try to ban it, we also need to be mindful that we've got to police that ban in some way. We know that the AI tools that are out there are not particularly reliable. They may not even be valid at all. There's lots of good work that's been come, that's coming out about that peer reviewed work that's showing um, that we've got to be very careful about the way that we use the AI detectors. The information that's being sent around the university, I think would, would um, align with this. The other side of this, of course, is that if you go onto YouTube and put in, how do I get around an AI detection tool? There are literally already hundreds of videos that will walk students through step-by-step step on how to avoid being detected by a, an AI detection tool. So on a couple of fronts, this idea of banning it is a bit of a problem. Um, you can imagine, for example, if we were to try and ban predictive text or the little red squiggly lines that come under something that we might have spelled incorrectly, the, the large language models are going to be so deeply embedded into the applications that we're using that it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense um, to do that. So overall, we think that it's probably fairly problematic to try and ban these technologies now. It's not looking like it's going to be particularly viable in the medium term. And in the long term, I just don't think that there's any real way that a ban is, is going to be viable. And that seems to be playing out. Um, some of this is happening probably more rapidly than we might have thought as we've been working through this. So ignoring and banning don't look like they're particularly viable at this stage. Um, they're already looking problematic. So that brings us to the other options that we have on the table. One and the most obvious one, I think, is to invigilate around the technologies. One of the immediate other responses apart from banning the technology was, well, we should just get everybody back in the the good old fashioned, you know, invigilated exam where they all sit in rows as though, you know, students hadn't found ways to cheat in this environment over a long period of time as well. It's probably still an option. It's still an option that we need to consider, but it's not going to be the kind of thing that will be the go to in every situation under all circumstances as it was before. But we've got to, I think, be mindful that there are situations where this is still an appropriate way of of assessing students. Um, so when done with care and, and appropriately used. The other option, of course, that's coming up a lot is that we will start to introduce a lot more oral type assessment. And we know that that's something that we've been doing here for our PhD candidates. Uh, we're, not, we're now starting to see the first lot go through where they, where they do have a, an oral component to their examination. There are a couple of issues that I think emerge from this one. One is that if we're asking students to do some sort of presentation, there's nothing to stop them from producing a script that they can then read off, memorise, uh, that will potentially then show that they've kind of meeting these outcomes. So there's a, a slight problem there. Now, that's just if we're talking about presentations, but I think, yeah, I think if we're doing something that's more interactive, more like a Q and A, then that changes the scenario, right? So absolutely. I think that that's a, a really important point. But if we're just talking about students straight up presenting material, there's nothing to stop chat GPT being an enormous help with that component as well. And I'm gonna talk about this case a little bit more in a second. 
One other way that we might attack this is to get students to do some reflection activities that will hopefully give us a little bit more insight into the process that they've gone through to, to learn and arrive at an artifact. Some research that's literally come out in the last 24 hours puts a little bit of doubt on this one as well. So this is from the context of a pharmacy course where uh, some colleagues of mine at, at Monash University tested out some of the assessment in that particular course to figure out whether or not uh, ChatGPT would be able to produce something that would be passable for a reflection activity, and it did. Again, this is about assessment design and it's not as though it's like one type of assessment is going to solve this problem. I think as per the oral assessment, if we think about how we would do this carefully, there is a place for it. But ChatGPT can seem to produce some material that would look like the sort of, sort of generic types of reflection um, posts or otherwise that we might ask students to produce. Yeah. So students are memorising complete presentations or, or reading them. You know, if we're prepared to accept students who, who read for presentations, that's, you know, they could just read the script out. Um, alongside of that, I think there are other uh, kind of invigilation approaches that are being discussed that look something more like the kind of lab book approach that you might see in a science context where you've got some sort of recording of a, a process over time in a more granular way that might allow a bit more of an insight into how students have, have developed. There's going to be problems with that with different size courses, but it is one other option that's on the table there. Um, and then I think there's an interesting idea. So Kath Ellis from UNSW has talked about this a little bit, which is, I think, coming back to some of the oral assessment approaches, which is she framed it as uh, you can sort of give students a written assignment, they submit it, we sit down for half an hour, tutors sit down for half an hour and work through that assignment. What about if we use that half an hour to have a conversation with the student instead and through that conversation come to understand whether or not they actually understand the material. I've got 200 students in one of my courses and the idea of scheduling 200 half hour conversations in business hours makes my brain melt. Uh, so there are obviously some logistics that would need to be sorted out there, but I think that there is at least something in this idea that we might shift some of the way of the assessment working from I'm looking at this particular artifact to I'm having something that looks a little bit more like a conversation with a student that allows me to get a better sense of whether or not they really understand the, the material or not. Um, and I suspect that there's something in that that allows us some level of invigilation beyond um, you know, just the submission of a particular artifact. So where we're thinking about this one at the moment is that in the short, medium and long term, there probably is still a place for various forms of kind of invigilation around these new tools as they've emerged, but it's got to be done appropriately and fit. It's not, you know, we don't feel as though there's a case for every single course in the university needing to have a, you know, a big exam in a, an invigilated exam setting. It's got to be horses for courses for this one. Um, okay. so. Fourth option is to embrace this new technology in various different ways. And people have also been making this argument uh, right from the beginning is that you know, the new reality is here and this is what we now need to deal with. So we should just embrace it and get on with it. Lots of commentary about that out there. You don't need to go too far, far to find that. Um, I think that there is probably a continuum here. We tried something in my course, which was that we got uh, ChatGPT to generate a lesson plan. And once it was appropriate, we then taught it as ChatGPT recommended, which was interesting. We had to work very hard because there was a lot of misalignment there between um, what it was sort of guide suggesting that we should do in the way that we would normally teach. But I think this starts to give us some ideas about the ways in which we might be able to integrate and embrace the technology in what we're doing broadly. So this is a lesson planning component, but we can also think about what it might mean for assessment and other aspects of what we're doing in, in our courses. I have seen other instances. So this is Ethan Mollick, um, who's very active. He's from the Wharton Business School. Um, he's certainly worth following on Twitter or LinkedIn, has some really interesting things, puts out a weekly kind of newsletter -y type thing. Um, he's doing some really kind of interesting and at times quite radical things in some of his teaching. 
this one is an example of that. If it's blurry, I'll, I'll give you a sense of what it says in there. Um, he expects students to use AI. So as opposed to us kind of tinkering with it in our course and saying, well, we're using it, you might want to think about the way that you're using it. Um, and that's the conversation we have with our students. This is the other sort of end of the scenario, which is he's saying you must use it. This is something that we're expecting you to use in the course. And here are the ways in which you might need to, to think about doing that. So as you can see, there is a bit of a continuum there. And I think that that also flows through the, to the way that we might be thinking about how we're assessing the students. You know, are we expecting them to use it in their assessment? And what does that mean for the kinds of standards that we would be thinking about for the work that they're producing? Uh, are we giving them the option either way and getting them to acknowledge it? Where are we sitting on that, that kind of spread of, of possibilities there? There are some aspects of this that I think we would probably need to be careful of. Again, these are some things that are, there's quite a lot of commentary out there about. One is, you know, how good students are at kind of prompting these systems. I've spent a lot of time playing around with particularly chat GPT, but also Bing. Um, and I think even then I'm probably not very good at prompting it. Is it fair to create assessment tasks where that is a differentiator between the students, how good they are at prompting the technology or not? That's an open question. There are also issues around whether or not students can pay to get the upgraded version. So GPT-4, for example, although you can access it for, th for free through Bing, um, if you're getting it through chat GPT, you have to pay for that. Is that fair that some students have access to that and some students don't? So I, I think at the moment, we need to be a little bit careful about the way that we're embracing this technology and integrating it in because there are some issues that make it a little bit unfair. There is some really good thinking emerging around the depth and the this kind of continuum of ways that we might embed this in what we're doing in our teaching and then how that flow, flows through to the assessment. Inga Molinar in, in the Netherlands, I think, has, has done a particularly good job with this. She's come up with this continuum, which at one end is all us or all the students at one end or all the technology at the other end. And then what are the kind of different levels at which we might see that play out across that continuum. I think it's a good starting point for starting to tease apart, you know, what kind of interaction are we expecting to have with the students from our end and what kind of interaction they're having with the technology at their end. So we're now thinking about this as a basis for trying to understand the ways in which the, the students are organically using the technology already, um, because there, there seems to be quite a lot of um, activity and students have cottoned onto this quite quickly. So here's where we think we are currently in terms of how we might embrace these technologies or not. There are some issues that we would probably need to consider carefully in the short term. In the medium term, there probably is still a discussion to be had about whether or not it's appropriate, what is appropriate and to what level is appropriate. But in the long term, at least based on what we're seeing at the moment, it's hard to make the argument that we don't need to embrace this somehow. You know, this is something that will have an impact on probably most of the, you know, career directions that our students are going to have beyond graduation. So it's kind of hard to see how we can't embed this somehow. Um, this is a, you know, a technology that doesn't seem to be going away and is having a fairly significant impact. This one, the fifth option, design around the limitations of the technologies. Um, I think Luke's in here with us today. He's been playing around with this in terms of uh, the limitations for critical thinking. This was something that I think emerged early on. I wrote some um, commentary around this towards the end of January, where I tested out the assessment tasks that I've been assigning my students. It didn't do a very good job of it at that stage. However, I think that that has changed quite a bit, particularly since um, GPT-4 was released. So my point here when I wrote about this in January is that uh, the assessment tasks that I've been assigning to students, at least at that stage, it was quite difficult to get GPT-3 to produce a passable response to those tasks for a couple of different reasons. One was because of this argument about the stochastic parrot, which is that many of the large language models have a whole lot of information in them that has been drawn from the internet and other places. Often that information is flawed, shall we say, for a number of different reasons. So what it is essentially doing is taking the garbage that's out there and spitting it back out again, all right? So stochastic parrot. 
So there was a bit of a garbage in, garbage out problem. There are a couple of kind of fundamental misconceptions that I asked my students to think about in my course. And if they went and, you know, got ChatGPT to produce uh, an output based on the assessment that I assign, it would often just spit the garbage back out. Um, as I said, that has changed quite drastically since GPT-4. There is some information in there about context. So I said before that I've asked it to produce a lesson plan for the Queensland context for the senior secondary curriculum in psychology in Queensland. And it, without giving it much more information, it, it did a reasonable job of that. It knew about new, so I'm anthropomorphizing it. It had information in the, in the bank of data that it's got about that syllabus uh, and what the different topics are within the syllabus. And it was able to produce something that wasn't particularly good, but was okay. Where it also fell short was that it wasn't able to really link components together. So while it could produce a lesson plan, uh, another part of that task is to justify that lesson plan. It could produce a fairly generic justification, uh, but not one that was linked to the actual plan that was produced. Uh, so there was something about the way that having different components together that it wasn't really doing a very good job with. That has changed quite dramatically. So there's a sort of uh, visual representation. That if that's blurry or not, you can still see the difference on that one. GPT-3 and GPT-4. GPT-4 is vastly more enormous in terms of the amount of data that's in it. It does a much better job with these components. And it doesn't take much for students to figure out how to make it connect the dots between them. So part of this is about the size of the model. And part of this is also about the capacity of students to be able to also figure out how to put the pieces together. So while it was a viable approach to say, look, GPT 3.5 doesn't do a very good job of this. So I can have some confidence that my students aren't just running out and doing their assessment by you know, inserting it into GPT and getting it to produce a response. I'm far less confident about that now since GPT-4. And I think that's kind of the, the consensus that I've seen around the place. So where it was sort of viable um, to think about designing around the weaknesses of the system, it's becoming risky. And I think over the longer term, particularly as students get better at using the technology. So it's not just the technology that's the, you know, the main part of the equation here, but it's also about how students are using it. I think over the medium and long term, trying to exploit the weaknesses of these systems um, is probably not that viable. I think there are probably other things that we need to, to do to think more broadly about the way that we're, we're assessing students. Which brings us to number six, which is the tricky one, uh, I think is fair to say. So given what we've just talked about with the other options, they're not all gonna work in all scenarios. I think that there probably is some work that we need to do to rethink some of the assessment practices that we've used for a long time. The more I've been playing around in this space, the more I'm thinking that there are multiple components of the assessment tasks that I've been assigning to students that I think we're gonna to have to, to revisit and rethink. Part of this comes from this post that I mentioned previously. And I think that there was some really important and insightful commentary that came out of it. One of the things that the students said in this post, so this was on Reddit, I worked with three other people on delivering a presentation about a topic, quite frankly, we couldn't care less about, right? So it comes back to this motive, means and opportunity equation, right? So there's not much I think we can do about the means. I think the opportunity is also there as a result of that, you know, being easy to access these, these materials and these applications online. That leaves us with the motive as being something that we probably need to think more carefully about. And I think, you know, the way the students have talked about this task where they've just, you know, used ChatGPT to produce a, um, a script that they then read out probably gets at that. And a colleague of mine, Stu, sort of made the point if the if this assessment task feels like it's a chore it doesn't encourage any creativity it doesn't actually have any sort of purpose to it that the students can see then what's the kind of point of the assessment task and that probably is what the students are asking themselves so the motive component here i think is is an important component in all of this it does bring us back to why do we even assess students in the first place how are we doing it why are we doing it what is the point of it uh, it was a question that I've, I looked back at this and I was asking this question nine years ago. Um, 
so I think that there has been a thread of questioning about some of the sorts of established assessment practices that we've had in place for some time. David Carlos from Hong Kong, who's probably one of the world's leading experts on um, assessment, has also made a similar argument in the last couple of weeks in that we sort of realised that there were some problems with the ways that we were thinking about assessment in higher education that we're now being forced to kind of address, but they've sort of been trickling along in the background uh, without us necessarily progressing very far on, on some of these issues for some time. One of the ways that we have particularly been thinking about this, and this is not the only way, but it sort of, I think, gets at the heart of the problem is that we think about what a learning trajectory looks like over a 12, 13, 15 week course. We sort of expect students to be, now it's never linear like that, of course, but they're going along this trajectory where they're developing their knowledge, understanding and ways of being able to use that knowledge. And periodically we get a kind of some sort of insight into what's happening through a, a sort of snapshot, whether this, it's the submission of an artifact or an exam or some other way. But we've essentially been sort of inferring that trajectory through these kind of momentary snapshots, if you like. Um, a lot of people are now talking about how we might rethink assessment so it more broadly represents some sort of trajectory over time. Now that's not gonna be easy and I don't think anybody's suggesting that it's gonna be easy, but part of the argument that people like Rose Luckin in the UK and Valerie Shute in North America are saying is that, well, we've got this technology you know, generative AI and AI more broadly that we're all saying is problematic. We could also think about that as being an opportunity to help us in ways that we might better understand what that trajectory looks like over time. So they're certainly making the argument that we, we will have some work to do, but there are opportunities for leveraging the technology to actually better understand the process of learning rather than the sort of snapshots that we've been relying on up until this point. Part of the equation needs to also be the way that peers, you know, um, peer assessment or peer evaluation might impact on that, the interactions that we have with students back and forward. So it's not as though we're just saying here that it's just about AI solving all of the problems, as I think Inga Molinar's work probably also suggests is that there is a, um, you know, a continuum here of things that we could potentially be thinking about. Bottom line is it's, it's not going to be easy to do it, but there are certainly opportunities there. We tried to capture some of this in a paper from last year. That might be blurry, we'll send around the slides later on, but we wanted to sort of map out what are the sort of key fundamental options that we have in relation to the way that we're designing assessment in this artificial intelligence age. Funnily enough, we kind of weren't actually seeing ChatGPT on the horizon when we were putting this together, but it kind of came out at just, <laughs> just the right time and lined up. So we have tried to sort of map through a number of different scenarios, again, drawing quite a bit on Valerie Shute's work and Rose Luckin's work to, to think about what the, you know, the fundamental options are for, for assessment redesign. There are another set of questions emerging about what is it that we're actually assessing? And is it just that students know things? Is it about who they are and who they're becoming? What are we actually doing to assess their, their thinking, particularly around uh, critical thinking and creativity? Uh, you know, is too much emphasis been on what they do, you know, as a way of kind of seeing through to what they might be thinking or who they're becoming or, you know, what they actually know. There's a long way to go on this, I think, but there is some work, I think, that is probably giving us a starting point. So what are we really talking about here when we're talking about rethinking assessment? This is sort of bringing you up to speed with where I think the national conversation currently is. Um, I, I know that Texa is really interested in providing more information about this. And there are a lot of people grappling with all of the issues that we've talked about up until this point. What does it mean and what might a new regime of assessment look like? There are some clues. And um, this was one paper that's been circulated over the last couple of weeks that I think is a useful starting point. This might not be where we end up landing, but, and I don't know who this person is. They've sort of come out of nowhere, but I think they've got some really good ideas and essentially, he kind of stripped it down to these sort of principles, if you like. So we're, talk we're talking about interaction. We're talking about processes as opposed to products. Um, assessment that's iterative, you know, kind of like the lab book approach or, you know, ongoing reflections. 
what is it that humans do that machines can't, which I think goes back to some of the critical and creative thinking aspects. Uh, reflection implemented in such a way so that it can't be kind of done in a generic sense as they tested with the pharmacy example that I talked about before. Assessment is authentic. I'd probably go beyond that because, you know, as we've seen, ChatGPT can do a great job of producing business reports or lesson plans or lots of different types of um, artifacts that would essentially be authentic as in the kind of real world environment. So I think it's more than just sort of authenticity as in a workplace document. Um, and using things that we have used for a long time wherever appropriate and by analog assessment, it means in a lot of cases, putting students in a room and either getting them to speak through or, or fill out an exam script. I thought that was a useful one. The, the options that we have kind of been working through, so this is with my colleague, Sarah Howard from the University of Wollongong and um, Jacqueline Broadbent from Deakin University. We sort of started with these kind of six options that we've been working with. We're not sure that this is where we're going to end up. This is really just the start of our thinking. And there are a lot of moving pieces in this. It's authentic, but not just authentic, also contextualised in some way seems to be important. Uh, the motivation bit that I touched on previously seems to be critical in here. So is the assessment engaging? Does it have some sort of purpose that students can see? Does it involve critical or creative thinking in a way that kind of moves beyond what the technology can do? Um, is it you know, adequately challenging students on that front? Is there mastery and agency in there? So this is a kind of self-regulated learning piece that fits into all of this. Um, we have a kind of process occurring over time and it builds on relationships and community in some way. So we were sort of thinking about this before this other work that um, I mentioned here came out, but you can see that there are a lot of similar sorts of themes emerging um, across the different kinds of principles that we're sort of working with here. So that's where the current thinking is about what we might start to do around the rethinking of assessment, but this is really early days uh, as far as this part goes. So where we kind of think that this might be headed is at the moment, this is really hard to rethink what our assessment practices might look like, but over the medium and long term, it's probably not something that we can necessarily avoid. So overall, that's how we are currently kind of guessing that this table looks like. It is a guess, we admit that, but we're trying to do our best to figure out what the options are on the table that we currently have. In the short term, I think there is no easy option here. I think any of the six that we're talking about here are challenging for various different reasons. In the medium term, I think that there are some that we can probably say are not looking very viable. And in the long term, we start to see that, you know, there will still be a role for invigilating assessment in various different ways where appropriate and done with care. Embracing this is probably something that we're going to need to think about doing. And ultimately, we're probably going to start to also need to rethink some of the assessment practices that we've used for a long time across a number of different dimensions that we're still trying to figure out. Okay, so I've probably done enough talking. It'd be good to have a chat about some of these things. Um, but hopefully that was useful to give you a sense of where the conversation is sort of going um, around what our options are and what these are looking like on into the future.